the social attitudes and the atmosphere of the 60s. Karate Kid was me back in 1965 in a television series called The Avengers. The Avengers was one of the most popular series of the 60s, both here and in America. And one of the things that made it so popular was its style. Everything about it was bang up to date and fashionable, especially the heroine of the series, Emma Peel. Miss Peel was everything a woman in the 60s had to be. Young, independent, intelligent and glamorous. With dark eyes, long legs and always, but always dressed in the very latest gear. Miss Peel was, as they said, the most with it of chicks. Miss Peel was very typical of the swinging 60s. In today's programme we're going to look at if and how the 60s swung. Let's start with a newsreel of some of the things which happened in the 60s. England 3, Germany 2. The second period of extra time. And Hurst scored for the third time. England had won the World Cup. Longbridge, a big day for the Little'un. This is the two millionth mini in company with some of those who helped make the pint-sized people car into an international achievement. It's ten years since the first mini came off these assembly lines. Ten years of tremendous success in both home and, more important, overseas markets. Just before 4 a.m. on the 21st of July, British audiences joined 600 million people around the world to watch Neil Armstrong take the first steps on the moon. This is Carnaby Street. Nowadays, it's a, a big tourist attraction with all sorts of souvenirs for sale. Back in the 60s, it was the place to buy your trendy clothes. So, for fashion, London, the world's most swinging city, was where it was at. But for music, it was another British city that topped the pops. Liverpool. Anyone who ever loved could look at me. I like it, I like it. Sugar and spice and open nights. Kisses sweeter than One of the Liverpool pop groups was The Scaffold. They shot to fame with the song Lily the Pink. The Scaffold wasn't just a pop group. They were performers as well, and one member of The Scaffold, Roger McGough, was, and still is, a poet. We asked Roger McGough to give us his view of Liverpool and Britain in the 60s. Hello. Let's take a liver bird's eye view of Liverpool today. It's changed a lot since I was a boy. It's cleaner for a start, but far less busy. While I was growing up here, they said that Liverpool was a great city, that England was a great country, and that the sun would never set on the British Empire. But it didn't ring true somehow, so I put my tongue firmly in my cheek and wrote this little epic. Oh, Liverpool on the Mersey River, noble city, how I shiver with pride at the thought of your history and your great men who are gone. 
like Huskisson and Mr. Gladstone. You are the second greatest port in all the land, and your population runs to 800,000. 20 miles of busy docking, thanks to all the good men walking on them. The brave stevedores and men in crane driving have helped to make this great port thriving. Your flour mills and other famous industries, biscuit, pea, soap and sugar factories, all play a very important part. And of all industrial southwest Lancashire, Liverpool is the very heart. Noble city, astride the River Mersey, I am sure we all salute thee. And we did salute the city, and we still do, we're very proud of it. But economically, we knew there was only one way to go, and that was down. We'd won a war, but at such cost, the port was never able to recover. Gone are the liners, the Reina del Mars, the P&Os and the CPRs. Gone are the liners, the pride of Cunard, now ghost-ridden hulks in the knacker's yard. Gone are the liners, the glories of old, now seagulls redundant sign on at the dole. But of course, the face of a city doesn't change overnight. And even though there were dark clouds gathering on the horizon, in the 60s I was young. And when you're young, there are more important things to worry about, like what to wear. Back in the 1950s, teenagers were just beginning to want to look different from their mums and dads. There were the teddy boys, of course, with their drainpipe trousers, crepe soles, suede shoes and their long jackets. But that was real rebel stuff. It wasn't until the early 60s the teenagers really started into fashion in a big way. Money was one reason why it all started to happen. Jobs were easy to come by. With a good wage packet at the end of the week, the young swingers could get out there and buy the clothes they wanted to wear. For the girls, something else paved the way for their fashion fling. Tights. Without them, one of the biggest dress revolutions of the 1960s might never have happened. The miniskirt. Hemlines went higher and higher. The older generation thought it was the height of nonsense. Mary Quant was one of the fashion gurus at that time. The rise and rise of the miniskirt was largely her doing. But she and other new wave fashion designers had lots more than miniskirts to offer the trendy chicks of the 60s. Clothes became far out and fun. Change wasn't just for the birds. At the end of 1960, something happened to pave the way for blokes to put on the style. National service was abolished on the 31st of December 1960. Up until then, 18-year-olds had to spend two years in one of the services, usually the army. And of course, in the army you need your air cut. Now that they weren't whisked off into the army and given their short back and sides, the boys could really break out of their father's mould and do their own thing. Growing their hair was one way they did it. Give me a head with head, long beautiful head, shining green wings, streaming flax and wax. Give me down to their hair, shoulder length longer. Here, daddy, there, mama, everywhere, daddy, daddy, hair. Blow it, show it, long has got to go in my hair. The way they dressed was also important for them. But unlike the girls' scene, where variety was a spice of life. The boys tended to abandon the uniform of the old National Service days for a uniform of their own. Two tribes seemed to emerge, the Mods and the Rockers. Mods dressed in snappy suits, wore button-down shirts and rode motor scooters. Rockers wore heavy-duty leather gear and burned up the roads of Britain on the noisiest bikes they could find. Occasionally, the mods and the rockers went to war. There was a lot of hard cases down from the East End and they were just looking for people to have a fight with, really, uh, that they didn't like the look of. And um, there were some hefty fights down there. It was general hooliganism, probably a massive nuisance to anyone else having a, a day out down to Brighton. But there was very, very rarely any serious trouble. 
very serious trouble, very rarely. But it was made out to be very serious trouble. For the 60s generation, what you wore and how you looked was important. But even more crucial than that was the music. In the 50s, solo singers like Tommy Steele and Cliff Richard were all the rage. By the 60s, a new phenomenon had hit the scene, the group. With electric guitars and drum kits, singers didn't need a separate band to back them. They could give themselves all the backing they needed. They belted out their own backbeat. In bedrooms and back rooms up and down the country, thousands of likely lads plucked their guitars, whacked their drums, and dreamed about forming their own groups and making it to the big time. For some, their dreams came true. These groups set out to attract the young rather than the old. One way to do that was to appeal to the rebel instinct in the young. They gave the kids music their mummies wouldn't like. One group called The Who put on an act that really shocked the old. The Who were bad, but there was another group that was even badder. The Rolling Stones. Everything about the Stones was anti the old and the establishment. Their lyrics, their looks, their clothes, their stage act, all caused shock and horror among the older generation. The Stones were one of the most popular groups of the 60s, but not even they could match the group which topped all the pops. The Beatles. The Beatles were the pop sensation of the 60s. Their records sold by the million. Tens of thousands of fans went to their concerts. Beatlemania swept the world. Back in their hometown of Liverpool, they became a legend in their own lifetime. Oh, I love you. I'll always be true. So please. In the early 60s, the Cavern Club was one of the Beatles' regular haunts. Suddenly, all things bright and musical were coming out of the city. And there wasn't dancing on the streets, there was dancing underneath them. In places like the Cavern, a jazz club when I first knew it, which overnight became the most famous rock and roll venue in the world. Many of the top groups from Liverpool were discovered in the cavern. One of them was the foremost. Billy Hatton, formerly a bass player, but the foremost. Bill, what was the atmosphere like in those days? Uh, well, because of the walls, as you can see, very, very close, very, very low. Lots and lots of people inside. It was very sweaty, very, very hot. And in fact, the sweat used to condense off the roof and sort of run down the sides, not only the walls, but down your sides as well. It, it was slightly pongy as well, <laughs> because of that. In fact, an, an example, there was a, a young lady I knew from a very well-to-do family in Walton, and uh, they weren't allowed to go down to the cabin because they thought it was particularly seedy. But all their friends used to go, and she didn't want to be left out of the gang, so she used to keep a, a pair of jeans and a sweater and some shoes and things in a bag, which used to put 
by the bin at the bottom of the garden. So all these clothes would sort of take on this essence of bin. And when her friends came back from the cavern, she would put the clothes on and stand by and say, oh yes, I, I've been down to the cavern, and they'd sniff her as proof <laughs> of this, because of the smell. Thanks, Bill. Now, the Mersey sound wasn't only rock and roll. In those days, many coffee bars used to host weekly poetry reading. Coffee bar, I hear you say? We must remember in those days that pubs closed at 10 o'clock at night. There were no discos, and as though the 60s got into their stride, very few nightclubs. So, people used to sit round in coffee bars and drink warm froth and discuss the world's problems. It was great. I bet you're sorry you missed those days, aren't you? For Roger McGough, the 60s was a time of pop and poetry. I've come here to Grosvenor Square in the middle of London to present a different side to the 60s. Protest. That building behind me is the American Embassy, and in 1968 it was the focus of the most violent demonstration that had happened in Britain since the fascist rallies of the 30s. It started out as a peaceful demonstration, but when a section of the marchers broke away from the main group to make for the American Embassy in Grosvenor Square, violent clashes broke out between the police and the demonstrators. The violence in Grosvenor Square overshadowed the reason behind the demonstration. It was a protest against a war which the United States was fighting in Vietnam, a country in Southeast Asia. Demonstrators believed that America was using its military power to prop up a government in Vietnam that the people didn't want. The American government said that the war was to stop the spread of communism. Throughout the 60s, a struggle took place between the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. The Cold War, it was called. Vietnam was just one of many places where this Cold War went on. American and Soviet troops never actually fought face to face, but at times, as in Cuba in 1962, a full confrontation became perilously close. The result of such a conflict would have been truly horrific. Both the superpowers now had enough nuclear weapons to destroy both themselves and the entire world. This terrifying prospect of nuclear war made thousands of people in Britain join CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. CND was well supported by students and young people. Many of them didn't just want to ban the bomb. They wanted to do away with the system which had produced the bomb. Some of them wanted to change their country by revolution. And in universities and colleges up and down the country, students took action to try and overthrow the old order of things. Other young people took a different route to try and change the world. Their idea was to create a new alternative society. A society based on peace and love. They looked to India and the East for their inspiration. These were the hippies, the flower children. All around the world they would come together to celebrate and share their vision of how life should be led. It wasn't surprising that it was the Beatles who provided one of the anthems for these young people.